Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the University of South Carolina's Constitution Day event. My name is Kirk Randazzo. I'm chair of the political science department, uh, and I'll serve as your host for tonight. Uh, some of you may be aware Constitution Day uh, was started uh, several years ago as part of a federal statute uh, that was actually authored by Senator uh, Byrd from the state of West Virginia. And we are very fortunate to have Dr. Artemis Ward from Northern Illinois University with us tonight. We'll introduce Dr. Ward in just a minute, but first I would like to introduce William Hubbard, uh, past president of the American Bar Association and currently the dean of the School of Law here at USC. So Dean Hubbard, the, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Professor Randazzo. I'm glad there's so many people uh, attending tonight because we have an important topic. There's, there's a lot being said today about people's freedom and liberty. Judge Learned Hand is perhaps the greatest American judge not to have served on the US Supreme Court. On May 21st, 1944, just days before the D-Day invasion on the beaches of Normandy, he spoke before thousands in Central Park in New York at the vast I Am an American Day ceremony. And his remarks were entitled, The Spirit of Liberty. Judge Hand said this, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. And what is this liberty which must lie in the hearts of men and women, he asked. He responded, it is not the ruthless, the unbridled will. It is not freedom to do as one likes. He said, that is the denial of liberty and leads straight to its overthrow. He continued, a society in which men recognize no check upon their freedom soon becomes a society where freedom is the possession of only a savage few. We all know that history shows that democratic governments are fragile and often fail. Public trust and confidence are essential to the preservation of our democracy. There is much political rhetoric now that seeks to undermine public trust in elections, courts, and democratic processes and institutions. If people say the court system is rigged or elections are rigged without evidence to support those assertions, those statements feed into the public distrust of democratic norms and institutions and the fabric of our nation becomes frayed. Part of our defense of the rule of law should be directed to protecting the independence of the judiciary, one of the three co-equal branches of government. In recent years and recent days, attacks on the judiciary have increased while public understanding of the essential role of the judiciary has diminished. Our constitutional democracy depends on the proper separation of powers, which of course includes an independent judiciary. Alexander Hamilton placed judicial independence at the top of his list of reasons to take up arms in the American Revolution. He wrote extensively of its importance in the Federalist Papers. Justice Ginsburg noted that an independent judiciary is essential to the rule of law and stated that judicial independence can be shattered if the society that law exists to serve does not take care to ensure its preservation. Justice Kennedy stated, has stated that judicial independence is not so that judges can do what they want, but so they can do what they must. This critical concept of judicial independence finds its roots in chapter 17 of Magna Carta sealed 806 years ago which provides, and I quote, common pleas are not to follow our court, but are to be held in some fixed place. This chapter of Magna Carta led to the creation of the Court of Common Pleas, as opposed to the King's Court, which followed the King around the country and ruled as the King wanted. Separation from the King's Court made it clear that judges were to operate independently of the King. And this led to the development of the concept we cherish today known as judicial independence. As we tonight discuss term limits of judges, we must be mindful of the fundamental necessity of judicial independence. 
Now it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce the interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and my distinguished colleague as a professor of law here at the University of South Carolina School of Law, Professor and Dean Joel Samuels. Thank you so much, Dean Hubbard. And I wanna thank the law school for this ongoing partnership between the School of Law, the College of Arts and Sciences, Department of Political Science. This is an important relationship that annually tackles some of the most important issues facing our country and our world, as Dean Hubbard has just laid out. To augment what Dean Hubbard just said, I want to speak specifically to the topic we're talking about tonight, the notion of lifetime tenure. We're very fortunate to have with us tonight, Dr. Art Ward, who's a leading scholar on one of the most fundamental questions that the framers of the constitution thought about, debated, disagreed about, and ultimately settled on, which was the notion of a lifetime tenure for federal judges. At the time, the federal court system involved very few judges. In fact, the Supreme Court justices sat as trial court judges in the early days of the American Republic. And the notion of lifetime tenure, as you'll hear today, was really one intended to insulate them from the political vagaries that Dean Hubbard was just speaking about. Over the years, there have been challenges to the notion of lifetime tenure, again, focused on the Supreme Court, but that, that, that exist for all Article III judges, for judges at the district court or trial court level, at the Court of Appeals, our interim appellate bodies across the country, and ultimately, of course, at the US Supreme Court. We're also a standard setter around the world where countries considering their process for judicial selection look to us to think about not only the selection process, but terms for judges and justices. At the same time, at the state level, we see different processes for selecting judges, for their tenures, and the pressures it places on them. Indeed, here in South Carolina, those very questions uh, arise on a regular basis through the process of legislative selection of judges on an ongoing basis. These are real questions with complex answers. And tonight, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Ward with us uh, to discuss this fundamental question at the heart of many of the, of the issues challenging our country and indeed our world today. Dr. Randazzo, I turn it back to you to introduce Dr. Ward. Thank you, Dean Samuels, appreciate that. Dean Hubbard, thank you for your comments as well. Uh, for those of us in the audience, uh, Dr. Ward is gonna speak uh, to us for several minutes. Uh, and then following his comments, we will have a, a question and answer period uh, and so those of you that are that wish to ask questions, uh, I would request that you type those into the Q&A window uh, in the webinar, not necessarily the chat window, but if you could put those in the Q&A window, that way I can see those and I will read those questions for Dr. Ward uh, when we finish up. But now it is my pleasure, it is my distinct honor to introduce our distinguished speaker for tonight. Dr. Art Artemis Ward is a professor of political science and a faculty associate in the College of Law at Northern Illinois University. He received his PhD from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University, and he worked as a staffer on the House Judiciary Committee in Washington, DC. He's published several books and articles on the US Supreme Court, and he's been featured on NBC Nightly News, on Fox News, on C-SPAN. Uh, he's had articles and references in the New York Times, the Associated Press, and the New Republic. Dr. Ward is also the two-time award winner of the Hughes Gossett Prize for Historical Excellence that's given out by the Supreme Court Historical Society. So we are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Ward with us tonight. Dr. Ward, the floor is yours to, to educate us about lifetime tenure for federal judges and whether it should be abolished. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk, uh, for that generous introduction um, and also for the introductory remarks for, of Dean Hubbard and Dean Samuels. I think they were excellent and, and provide a lot of food for thought. I'm, yeah, I'm going to go through, I've um, got a PowerPoint presentation and go through some slides here. 
um, you know, the next 20, 30 minutes or so. I want to leave plenty of time at the end for questions because um, Dr. Randazzo and Dean Hubbard, myself, we have a lot of experience uh, with some of these uh, questions that you may have. And so maybe not necessarily directed toward me, but to, to other members of, of the panel who may, may be weighing in as well. Um, so with that said, let's see if I can get my PowerPoint to come up here. Okay, I think that should be working. Okay. So yes, the question is, should life tenure for judges be abolished? And I'm going to provide some background information. Some of it may review be review for many of you. Um, some information maybe you don't know. Just some food for thought, really, to get the Q&A going. Um, that's kind of uh, the idea of these PowerPoint sides. I'm not making an argument per se about whether life uh, tenure should be abolished for, abolished for judges, but giving you some of the pros and cons um, on uh, with regard to the issue. So um, the first point I want to make about my remarks is that institutional reform of the Supreme Court uh, is, is dependent on how the court behaves. We'd like to think that institutional reform is handed down because of expertise, right? Experts say this is a way the court can be handled uh, better or run better, or the federal judiciary can be run better, uh, whether those experts be judges themselves or scholars. That's what we might think would be the path toward institutional reform. And even though judges and scholars have their own opinions about uh, what kinds of reforms should or shouldn't take place, um, the history of reform of the court shows that generally reform takes place because of the way the justices are be behaving with regard to deciding cases. If the justices are doing things that are unpopular, issuing decisions that are out of step with the political branches and the American people broadly, then the, they're risking their institutional legitimacy and they're inviting potential reform. Um, and so Part of that has to do with the life tenure process, this idea that judges can serve for decades and decades and decades and potentially get out of step uh, with the current times and, and therefore potentially engender the, the ire of, of um, popular institutions and uh, popular, um, popular will. So term limits have been proposed um, recently uh, as a way of minimizing the political maneuvering surrounding the succession process on the Supreme Court. And I want to use that word deliberately succession process, not the appointment process or the confirmation process, but the succession process broadly, which begins with a departure from the court and then comes right nomination and confirmation and so forth. And so we don't want to forget that beginning part. And that's something I want to talk a little bit about uh, in depth here um, this evening. Um, and while there are some justices that are actively currently working to protect the institution as much as possible, there are other justices who are um, pressing their warrants and playing a dangerous game in terms of um, seeing how far the court might go in terms of issuing decisions that are too far out of step with the mainstream. So that's going to be our plan uh, for the remarks. And, and, you know, the first uh, thing to do is to start out with the, what the Constitution says, and Article 3 doesn't say a whole lot, and it quite frankly isn't very specific with regard to judicial tenure. Uh, this is the phrase. Uh, sec Article 3, Section 1 says, the judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior. It doesn't say life tenure. So the question is, does the phrase good behavior equate to life tenure? Um, and, you know, textualists interpreting the Constitution have said that um, good behavior equates to life tenure. We have assumed that it, it is that for um, ever since the inception of the Constitution. And, and so the, the view of these uh, folks is, is if, if good behavior equals life tenure, then the only way to change the life tenure system of federal judges and Supreme Court justices would be through a Supreme Court amendment. And so um, that the amendment process would be the only way to change life tenure. And later on uh, in the lecture, we're going to talk about some alternative ideas um, about uh, how to uh, abolish life tenure, amend life tenure without um, passing a constitutional amendment, because this is being currently debated. So does good behavior equal life tenure? Well, if we look at the 
um, founding period and, and the immediate um, aftermath of that, what's interesting is we know that this life tenure idea follows the precedent of Great Britain for judicial independence purposes, as was laid out. Uh, and, and some of the opening com comments, certainly Dean Hubbard's views of judicial independence are something we want to keep foremost in our mind as we go through these various points. Um, and so that was the idea initially. Life tenure means you're independent of the political uh, branches, the political forces, popular forces, and therefore you can rule based on the law. Um, and early justices, um, interestingly, in thinking about are they going to serve for life or not, the earliest justices voluntarily left the court because it lacked prestige. Um, and because their job was not so much about meeting in Washington to decide weighty issues, but about traveling around the country. Um, and, and there was a lot of circuit writing, we, we, we call it in those days, imagine horse-drawn carriages, right, or just on horseback and foul weather and on, you know, muddy and dirt roads. And, you know, there are many examples of justices getting into accidents and falling off their horses and things like this. It was not very pleasant and, and the justices didn't like it. And so that caused a lot of them to want to leave their jobs after doing that uh, for a certain number of years. Um, it, it worked as a de facto kind of um retirement plan if you will right we can only do this for so long until we can get sick of it and then we we have to go do something else um, but circuit writing was eventually minimized and then ultimately abolished and then what happened at that point is the justices just started serving until they died and they did that because if they were to leave the court they would get no pension right if they wanted to retire let's say due to old age um, they would have no money coming in. And so they'd stayed on the court until they died. Some were not effective uh, and, and, and were being covered for, by the other justices uh, and, and you know, past their point of usefulness. And, and so this became a problem that was debated. You know, how did we solve this problem of justice is hanging on too long? Maybe the same problem we're, we're, we're dealing with now. Um, and so we'll, we'll get into some of those solutions in a second, um, what was decided at the time and, and what, what's been discussed since. Um, but we should also remember that the, you know, when we look at the US Supreme Court and, and the federal judiciary in the United States in, in, in a comparative context, not only compared with the founding period, but, but compared now with other Western countries and even on the state level for state judges, we see that the US Supreme Court is quite an anomaly. And, and increasingly so over time in terms of life tenure. The US Supreme Court's one of the few courts, high courts in the, in, in, in the world to have life tenure. And almost all democratic nations have either fixed terms or mandatory retirement ages for their top judges, even England, which of course was the system that the US um, was modeled on, uh, no longer grants its high court justices life tenure and they now have a mandatory retirement age. Um, and the U.S. states um, initially, many of them had 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 life tenure, and they they quickly um, abolished it um, in the Jacksonian era is when this these reforms started, and they've increased over time to increase the accountability of the judicial branch. Um, only Rhode Island today, only one state remains uh, in terms of their state judges having life tenure. All other states over time have mandatory retirement ages or they let their voters choose when judges leave, right? Um, through judicial elections, right? We will say when the judges will leave. Um, Rhode Island, the outlier. Rhode Island and the United States <laughs> in that sense. Um, so then we wanna, I wanna turn to this topic of the politics of succession. We're very familiar with the politics of confirmation and, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but there is a initial process which in, involves there has to be a vacancy right before there can be um, an appointment and and that vacancy doesn't just materialize out of thin air um, you know these generous retirement benefits that justices and federal judges have now um, were not there at the founding as, as I mentioned and 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 have been instituted instituted and and, and and expanded over time and we're going to talk about those in a second but because of that modern justices, have been able to time their retirements, unlike their early predecessors, because of you know arduous circuit writing duties or no pensions. Um, you know, timing it for political reasons was not foremost in the justices' minds. But that is the case today. Think about Justice Anthony Kennedy, who was a moderate conservative appointed by Republican Ronald Reagan. Um, he chose to retire in 2018 under President Donald Trump. 
who appointed Brett Kavanaugh, one of Kennedy's former clerks, to replace him. Why didn't Kennedy retire under Obama? Why didn't Kennedy wait until after the 2020 election? Well, the argument um, is partisanship, right? Partisanship. And it's not just Kennedy. Other justices um, in recent years are behaving in similar ways. Um, interestingly enough, for over half a century, no justice died in office until three did so in relative rapid succession uh, in recent years. Chief Justice Rehnquist in 2005 and um, Justice Scalia in 2016, Justice Ginsburg in 2020. Um, you know, the latter two, as you might all re well remember, so recent occurred during, pre during presidential election years. And what that does is it magnifies the increasingly partisan succession process, the departure decision, right, or, or non-decision, which is still a decision, the, the nomination, the confirmation process, all that taking place in the presidential election year ups the stakes enormously. And we remember Senate Republicans refusing to consider um, Obama's nominee to replace Scalia when they moved, uh, you know, but then they moved with unusual speed to confirm Ginsburg's replacement when Trump was president. These actions showing um, very clearly, I think, to the American people that this is a, a highly partisan process. Um, and why would it be so partisan if judges were supposedly independent, neutral decision makers? Um, so now that the Democrats are in power in the political branches, they have pushed for institutional reform, including ending life tenure and instating term limits for the justices. The question is, will they succeed? Um, current problems. Now, I mentioned this idea of politics driving the um, departure decision of federal judges and Supreme Court justices. Um, presidential appointments because of that have not been evenly distributed over time among Democrat and Republican presidents. Democrats have appointed only four of the past 19 justices, even though Less than half of the presidents over the last 50 years have been Republican. Um, how can they have such an advantage? Um, De Democrat Jimmy Carter had zero vacancies during his term, while Trump had three. And that's because of justices playing politics with their departure decisions, trying to time it right for favorable political climates. Um, and this has led to all sorts of divisiveness in the Supreme Court confirmation process. Um, Scalia was confirmed you know, unanimously without any dissent in 1986. Um, and, and Scalia was known for his conservatism when he was nominated. It's not that he became conservative after, but no justice has been confirmed unanimously since then. In 1987, um, confirmation hearings became this big spectacle when Democrats defeated conservative Robert Bork's nomination, 4258. Six Republicans voted against Bork um, in 1987. In 1990, Clarence Thomas was confirmed 52 to 48 despite the sexual harassment allegations against him. It was the closest confirmation vote for an approved nominee in history. Currently, partisan votes uh, along party lines are the norm with Trump Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett narrowly confirmed, 54-45, uh, 50-48, 52-48, 50 respectively. Um, this appears to be the norm. The increasing partisanship of the process um, makes these justices or potential justices look like political figures instead of non-biased interpreters of the Constitution, which in turn negatively affects how Americans view the court. And some of you may have seen today, there was a poll out, the court currently has an all-time low approval rating of 37%. And I think it was over 50% of the American people say uh, that they disapprove of the, of the courts. Um, these numbers are very troubling um, to, to the justices themselves um, and, and, and to those court observers who would uh, be concerned about the court's legitimacy as an institution. Now, life tenure has also motivated presidents to pick in younger and younger justices over time. In the post-World War II era, presidents have generally shied away from appointing jurists in their 60s, who would bring a great deal of experience to the bench, and instead are nominating judges in their 40s or 50s who could serve on the bench for many decades. 
and justices do. Uh, Thomas was appointed by Bush uh, in 1991. And Thomas was 43 years old. And, and because of all the criticism leveled against him, he, he was defiant and he said that he would serve for 43 more years. I'm 43 now, I'll serve for 43 years on the court. So if you're keeping track, Clarence Thomas, who is the longest serving member of the court, been there since 1991, will serve another 13 years if he sticks to his 43 year promise. Um, but I would submit that if nothing changes and there's a Democrat in office in 13 years, Thomas will not be retiring then. He will wait longer, unless there's a Republican before then that uh, he might consider departing under. This is the problem. Justice is timing their own departures for political purposes. So will term limits actually happen? What I've provided here um, is a, a, a table um, from, from my book on, on Supreme Court retirements that shows the effect of partisan politics and the executive and legislative branch on departures in the US Supreme Court. When does reform of that life tenure system happen and what are the results of it? Um, Americans are in favor of term limits broadly. Many experts have coalesced around this staggered 18 year term idea. Um, with a vacancy automatically occurring every two years in non-election years. So that means, um, let's say we had that law in place now, there wouldn't be a vacancy in 2020, but there'd be one in 2021. There wouldn't be one in 2022, but there'd be one in 2023. There wouldn't be one in 2024, but then there'd be one again in 2025. So on this sort of automatic calendar, we'd expect a, a president serving a one year, a one, one term, four years to get two uh, appointments. Is this going to happen? This is uh, there's been legislation proposed in Congress. The president has a uh, a group uh, that he's pulled together to look at possible reforms, including this one. Um, the table shows that uh, reform happens when um, there is partisan co-partisanship among the president and the Senate and the House, all from the same party, and they want to get opposition justices on the Supreme Court to leave because those opposition justices are either thwarting their will or are perceived to, uh, that will be thwarting their will. And so the idea is how do we get these lifetime appointed justices to leave? Um, and the solution is to make it more attractive for them to retire. First by, um, you know, inventing the idea of retirement benefits and then by making them more attractive over time. So. For example, in the beginning, retirement benefits, um, you know, when you leave the court, uh, you, you get, you know, uh, half your salary, and then it's in, eventually it's increased to your full salary, and then it's a, uh, there's added in that you can serve on lower courts and continue to be set as a federal judge, even after you retire from the Supreme Court. So these liberalizing influences on the retirement decision have allowed justices to time their departures. Um, to fit the right political climate in ways that justices didn't think about before these generous processes were in place. So we, we have a, a Democratic president, Democratic Senate, Democratic House, even if the majority is quite slim, of course, in the Senate, um, that would mean the climate would be right for passing a reform uh, of, of the life tenure system. Um, the question is, would it be term limits or would it be a further um, expansion, right, of retirement benefits. And what I'm going to say, which is, I think, a really interesting question is, what if those are the same? What if term limits is simply an expansion of retirement benefits and not um, an amendment, uh, you know, uh, not, not undermining uh, the Article III's good behavior provision and, and therefore doesn't require an amendment to the Constitution? So that's what we're going to get at in a second. Um, so think about life expectancy right, when the Constitution was ratified. 38 years old was the life expectancy. So if we were thinking about, you know, judges serving for life, they aren't gonna serve very long. Uh, it was rare for justice, for anyone to live uh, long lives back then compared to today, right, where now we expect uh, 80 on average is the life expectancy and justice is serving, you know, multiple decades on the high court. Now, one of my favorite examples is, um, I love to talk about Hugo Black and, and William O. Douglas. These are justices appointed at the end of the 1930s and served in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 1970s. Um, these are justice appo justices appointed during the Depression, serving in the 1970s. Um, you know, we talked about Clarence Thomas earlier, Amy Coney Barrett, how long will she serve? 
uh, she may outlive some of you uh, uh, students who are listening in. She's uh, quite young uh, in her early 40s. Um, so under the living constitution theory, uh, the framers did not intend the justices uh, to serve for as long as they do now because life expectancy was significantly shorter. Therefore, implementing term limits by statute now, as opposed to uh, constitutional amendment, would be consistent with the framers' intent and therefore constitutional. That for them, good behavior meant, you know, until, uh, you know, roughly age 40 or 50 or so, and that, that would be uh, enough, you know, 10 or 20 years of, of service at the most. Um, you know, if we think about that and we think about these staggered 18 year terms, isn't that exactly consistent then with what um, the historical record would show? Um, a similar approach to interpreting a good behavior um, points out that it doesn't expressly grant life tenure, right? The words itself, um, which means that um, it, justice serving good behavior could mean a law allowing justice to continue their service on another federal court after they serve on the Supreme Court, right? So you know, limit your service on the Supreme Court, but continue to serve on the lower courts. Um, indeed, that's what the current retirement statute allows justice to do as an option, though it doesn't force them to do it. So that would be, you know, the difference between the current statute and a proposed statute that would try to make this claim, right, that good behavior is consistent with um, staying a federal judge, but limiting the time uh, on the high court. Um, so term limits by statute is a possible way to avoid constitutional um, difficulties in terms of amending, right, the amending process with two thirds of both houses and three fourths of the states, very difficult part, um, hurdle to, to jump, it may be easier to do it statutorily. Now, another um, thing to consider is the, you know, we talked about the justice behavior. Well, we know political scientists track the voting behavior of the justices, and we can see how their ideological leanings change over time. Um, this chart shows that justices at the time of their confirmation hearings may have espoused a certain judicial philosophy, and, 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 and over time, that philosophy can change and become perhaps more liberal or, or more, more conservative, um, more ideologically focused over time and less moderate. Um, currently, Clarence Thomas is that, right? His views since his initial appointment have gotten more conservative, though there's some variation over time. And Justice Sonia Sotomayor has gotten more liberal over time. Um, my favorite thing about this, this graph is to look at uh, the bottom red line and, and look at William O. Douglas, who I mentioned before, was appointed in the 30s and over the course of his tenure became so far out of step, right, with the rest of the justices um, and, and even where he himself was when he was first appointed that uh, he's he's a significant outlier, outlier on the liberal side. So whenever people say, um, you know, the current court or a bunch of liberals, I say, well, not necessarily if you look at people from the past, like uh, William O. Douglas and William Brennan and, and Thurgood Marshall and others. Um, and as these justices drift from their initial positions, um, perhaps toward the extremes, um, we get a court that is uh, less representative of that moment where they were confirmed, right, by the, by the elected branches appointed, uh, uh, nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. Um, and, and this is potentially dangerous, right, for a, a institution that relies on legitimacy for its um, power. Um, there's, here's a blow up of, of the current ideological division of where the justices are. And you can see um, the dwindling liberal side um, means that there are six conservative votes. Now, um, we have Roberts, Kavanaugh, Baird, and Gorsuch a bit more moderate, right, than Alito and Thomas. And so there are ways to cobble together moderate coalitions um, without, say, Thomas on the right or Sotomayor on the left, if uh, the justices um, are so inclined to do so. And it appears as if um, some of them are and are trying to keep the court at the center and keep it away from the extremes. Um, I think Chief Justice Roberts and, and, 
And Justice Breyer, the leader of the court's liberal wing um, and, and the oldest member on the court, I think they're in concert together to try to do this. If you think about the, the justices' private conference room where they actually discuss the cases and vote on them, um, you know, we have no cameras in there, no one's ever been in there, but the justices themselves, but we have seen the notes and we know how the voting works and we know how the procedure is and it goes in order of seniority with the chief beginning the discussions. So if Chief Justice Roberts begins trying to find a moderate middle compromise position and says, I think we should you know, decide the case this way, Clarence Thomas sits opposite him at the other end of the table. And because he's the most senior associate justice and often Thomas is arguing against the chief and saying, no, we need to go in a, in a more extreme conservative direction. And then Breyer speaks left as the leader of the liberal ring. And if he agrees with the chief, that's a strong message, I think, that the two of them are sending, that we are going to compromise and try to find a middle ground. Um, they did that last term uh, and were able to get five votes, um, keeping the extreme justices away from uh, majorities. Um, as Robert said during his confirmation hearings, the court should try to avoid a jolt to the American legal system whenever possible. And it appears as if his behavior since he's been on the court has been uh, a, 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 nothing short of that. He is trying to keep the court in the middle, in the center, um, as best he can, um, given his powers as chief justice, which includes the ability to kind of um, set the agenda, if you will, when he begins the discussion of the case in conference to try to convince them to move in a more moderate direction than some of them might like. So last term, just to, you know, you may have read, read some headlines recently, the Roberts court, you know, is over. Roberts has no influence anymore. It's now the court belongs to other justices. Um, and, you know, the last slide shows to be, to be sure, there are six conservatives and, and there are five more conservative than Roberts. And so his vote is no longer a, a swing vote or a decisive vote. But if he and, and Breyer and the others can convince Kavanaugh, Barrett or Gorsuch to go along with them, then they perhaps got five justices and a majority. And they did that many times last term, sometimes more than five, six, seven, eight justices and a majority, even una unanimity. Um, and, and so um, the court, you know, did not overturn Obamacare uh, last a, a term, for example, a high profile case that would have upset great numbers of the American people. Um, the court did not get involved in Trump's second impeachment trial, right? Uh, neither the chief uh, himself presiding nor in any kind of appeal. Uh, the 2020 election um, disputes, the court refused to get involved in any of those challenges. This is an example of a chief justice in a court that knows that it is vulnerable and particularly during a presidential election year and the upheaval surrounding uh, the current climate, they do not uh, want to gamble with their institutional legitimacy uh, now, if ever. Um, Roberts was in the majority 90% of the time. And while Justice Kavanaugh may have been in the majority 98% of the time, <laughs> Roberts is still very much um, uh, part of, 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 of you know, the influential block there in the middle trying to control the court. Um, but the persuasive power of Roberts and Breyer has limits. And I think, you know, the, the, the discussion that we're having about um, disputes in Texas involving abortion law um, highlights that. And so just to get some of you up to speed, so, so you have a quick primer on it. Um, the court, of course, legalized abortion in the 1970s in Roe versus Wade nationwide. Um, it reaffirmed that right in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1993 with conservatives right, moderate conservatives holding the line against more conservative justices who would uh, have liked to have got, if not overturned Roe. And so the question would be, would the more moderate conservatives today also do the same as they did in Casey? Um, at the end of the 2019-2020 uh, term, the court, the court struck down that Louisiana abortion law, which had um, required those performing abortions to have admitting privileges at the hospitals within 30 mile, miles of the clinic. And the court struck that one down five to four with Roberts joining then the four liberals, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But Ginsburg is not there anymore, right? And so now there would only be three justices um, on the liberal side if Roberts were joining with them in an, in an abortion case. Um, and, and so there would only be four instead of five if Amy Coney Barrett doesn't go along. Um, that's what happened in this Texas case. Um, what's interesting is it's a Mississippi case that the court will decide for sure this term, 
um, certainly by June at the latest. Um, it's a Mississippi abortion ban that takes effect after 15 weeks. The court will decide that case this term, and that's an opportunity for them to revisit Roe if they want. The, the Texas law that we're all hearing about that bans abortion after six weeks and allows civil suits by private citizens against those who would aid abortions, that case, even though the, the justices refuse to stop it from going into effect, it will go into effect and then there will be lawsuits and then the justices can agree to hear those lawsuits if they choose. Um, but that isn't probably going to happen until 2022, 2023 at the earliest, uh, if not uh, later. Um, because of, um, of the justices currently leaving the law in place. Um, the quest, so the question for the court's five conservatives is whether they will stick together more often going forward as they did in that Texas um, decision without, moderate, without the moderating influence of the chief, thereby making the, chief, uh, the chief's vote and his arguments um, irrelevant. Will they do that um, as the years wear on um, or not? So um, to conclude, um, Reforms to the Supreme Court succession process are dependent on the behavior of the justices, not about what's good policy, unfortunately. If the justices are activists um, and oppositional to the um, current prevailing political branches and popular opinions of the American people, um, then they're going to engender statutory reform. Um, specifically, um, historically, we've seen the enactment and expansion of retirement um, benefits. Um, as opposed to more significant changes like trying to abolish life tenure. Um, but as I mentioned, those two things may be coming closer together um, in terms of position. The justices have demonstrated a willingness to compromise to find narrow outcomes in cases, as I mentioned. And this shows that, that it, many of them uh, you know, do not want to um, be the reason right, why um, Supreme Court reform comes to their institution, be blamed, right, for fundamental changes to an institution that they are trying to protect. Um, so even though term limits are currently on the table and being discussed, it's unlikely that they will come to pass. Um, even if they did, it would be, a, you know, there'd be a question of whether they would be uh, legal or constitutional. And that's something that we can talk more about in the Q&A. So I'm going to leave it there and, and turn it back over to um, Dr. Randazzo, if he wants to uh, say a few remarks or, or potentially lead some, some Q&A. So I'm going to stop my screen share here and um, mute. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Ward. Uh, appreciate that. Actually, Dr. Ward, I'm going to ask you to keep your camera on and you might as well keep your microphone on because we will move into the, the Q&A right now. Uh, and for folks in the audience, um, if you wish to ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A window, and I will start reading those uh, for Dr. Ward. But as those questions are coming in, uh, actually, I, I had a question emailed to me. So, so let's start with the email question and give the audience time to, to type stuff into the Q&A. Uh, so Dr. Ward, the email question goes, uh, if the goal of term limits for justices is to reduce partisanship or hyperpolarization, it seems as if that mechanism just trades one set of problems for another, because after all, the Senate could still refuse to confirm uh, a nominee. Would it be better instead to set the Supreme Court up like an independent commission where you have four justices, uh, four Democratic justices and four Republican justices and maybe the chief just moving back and forth from one party to the other on a staggered term? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, question. And, and these are the, the kinds of things that, you know, those scholars, those of us who were scholars and tried to study the, the, these sort of questions, we're happy that these questions now seem to be in front of the American people. Um, there's a, a policy window, we call it in political science, that is open now, potentially, right? The justices um, may have opened it themselves. Um, maybe it's the, you know, the, the, the confirmation process, the partisanship of the succession process that has opened it, but the window is open and, and potential reforms are afoot. Um, I, I, I'm happy to see, you know, discussions of reform and I'm not wedded to any particular reform. And I 
do know that the history of reforms at the Supreme Court, as you know, Dr. Randazzo, is that often a reform comes in and there are unintended consequences that can lead to things that people hadn't thought about. So it is good to think about alternatives and, and potential um, outcomes that we may not be uh, foreseeing if we were to move toward uh, life tenure. So yeah, perhaps there are things, um, you know, but, but can, can you imagine the upheaval to the institution, uh, you know, to change the court from what it is now to a co independent commission with, you know, that statutorily had to have four members from each party on it with the chief. You can imagine, boy, the pushback, right, from the federal judiciary on that proposal. So it would take, you know, a huge amount of push by the American people if they wanted to get something like that done. And, and are the American people ready to make that kind of a radical change to their Supreme Court? Not yet. It's the justices themselves, I think, who would probably have to do something horrible. And we can all debate what that is, a decision that, you know, would be resoundingly vilified that would then potentially cause the American people to want to go down a path like that, I think. Excellent. All right. So from the audience, uh, we have a question from Emily that asks, do you believe that life tenure issues could be resolved if there was just an age requirement for the Supreme Court? Yeah, that's a good question. And and certainly, we, as, as I mentioned, there are states and, and other countries that have mandatory retirement ages. Um, it's a potential reform, again. Um, you know, one of the, the things that is a problem, right, with mandatory retirement ages is, is, you know, the advances of modern science, right, and this idea that the founders could expect, you know, 38 years of life expectancy on average for their Americans, uh, the American people, and now we've got 80, you know, and we've almost, you know, tri tripling the life expectancy, uh, you know, who's to say? Uh, you know, what that number should be or whether it ought to be changed uh, and how it ought to be changed. A staggered 18 year term, what I like about it is the idea that you could uh, nominate someone who's older, right? The idea is to get away from nominating these people who are barely out of their 30s um, and try to maybe nominate someone who's in their 60s to the Supreme Court. You just wouldn't see that now, maybe mid to late 60s, um, you know, with life expectancy so high and people. Um, operating at high level later in life now, unlike ever before, um, you know, we should maybe ask those kinds of questions. Maybe mandatory ages aren't right, and maybe fixed terms are better. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Rebecca, uh, and that is, do you think if justices were given term limits, that the role of lobbyists and interest groups would become more powerful? Yes. Would lobbyists and interest groups become more powerful if we were to put term limits in place? It's hard to imagine lobbyists and interest groups becoming any more powerful than they already are. Uh, they are enormously powerful, not only in general, but also in the Supreme Court succession process. Um, as soon as there's a vacancy, the interest groups, you know, they, they go, go nuts. There's plenty of research in political science about uh, how interest groups mobilize their supporters, raise money, uh, make a huge deal out of these Supreme Court um, uh, vacancies because it, it helps their group uh, get bigger and, and reaffirms what their group is doing. And, and, and so, um, I, you know, I, 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 I think that Interest group lobbying is, is here to stay uh, in, in terms of um, generally and in, 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 with regard to the Supreme Court. Um, you know, for me, the question really is trying to take the politics out of the hands of the justices themselves. I think that's where we get into problems, right, where we have people pressuring Justice Breyer or pressuring Justice Ginsburg to retire. And they're, you know, they're not sure what to do. And, you know, this kind of thing. I don't think anyone envisioned the framers making such momentous political, you know, framers, justice is making momentous political decisions about the future direction of the court like, uh, like that. So um, that I would urge us to focus more on that beginning process um, than you know, in terms of what interest groups might or might not do. Thank you. Uh, so Mary asks, what are the current arguments for maintaining life tenure and why hasn't it changed yet? Yeah, why hasn't it changed yet? Um, you know, it's funny, we have seen these reforms on the state level, of course, right? But why not at the federal level? Well, you know, the default argument has always been, you know, if you're going to change it, you need to amend the Constitution, right? This kind of textualist uh, argument. Um, 
um, you know, it's life, good behavior equals life tenure, which means you have to pass an amendment. Amendments are hard to pass. Um, that's why there's been, you know, so few, a couple dozen <laughs> over the course of American history. So that would seem to be an obstacle and, and make people think, well, this is a non-starter. But, you know, as I suggested, there are a number of scholars now proposing these statutory changes that might be constitutional, right, if they were enacted. And, and, and so those might be um, helping people to think, you know, may cause people to think differently about the system. And maybe, you know, maybe it's not so hard to, to reform it. So uh, speaking of statutory changes that are constitutional, Tyler asks, what are your thoughts about either shrinking or expanding the size of the court? Yeah, I, you know, some of you probably know, right, that the court initially had many fewer justices than, than are on the court now, and that number's changed over time and was as high as 10 uh, after the Civil War. And, and so, you know, the Constitution says that Congress will, you know, set the number of justices and 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 so it just takes a uh, you know a statute majority vote in order for a president to sign into law to change the, the number of justices but imagine um that happening right imagine if that was the solution to our problem where we're just going to increase or decrease the size of the court because of whoever's in power in terms of what that would do to in terms of damaging the American people's view of the judiciary and its legitimacy. And, and it would only make it seem even more, I think, a partisan institution. And so I think a lot of people think nine is a good number. It's an odd number, right? So we don't end up with ties, even though sometimes that happens when a justice is recuses or there's a vacancy. So nine is as good as a number as any, because it's odd and, and maybe it and that allows enough voices there, nine voices to collectively think problems through. Um, you know, not too few, not too many. Um, you know, we've had nine, you know, for a hundred years. And so may, maybe there's some magic to that number. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, expanding the court, packing the court. We know the Roosevelt example, right? With the opposition justices um, trying to thwart the New Deal, succeeding in thwarting the New Deal to a large extent, and then Roosevelt threatening to pack the court. I, again, it would take some momentous, um, decisions by the court itself, self-inflicted wounds, right, that would open up um, a possibility for, for this kind of thing to happen. But even when that happened in 1937 with a popular president, right, re-elected Franklin Roosevelt, that you still didn't get court packing then. So if you couldn't get it then in the middle of the depression after an opposition court, court had thwarted the popular will over and over again for years, something like that would have to happen again. And there's no indication that this court is that crazy or stupid, quite frankly, to, to do that. They don't appear to be that crazy or stupid. So Sebastian asks a logistical question. Uh, if you had term limits, what do you do if somebody retires early or dies while they're still, or prior to the end of their term? Yeah, this is the kind of unintended consequences that we need to think through, right? So imagine you're serving an 18 year term and you know that your term is going to be up, right? Um, you know, after the next presidential election, let's say 2025, right? Your term is going to be up in 2025. So you're thinking, gee, you know, do I wait and retire when my term is up, or do I go ahead and leave in 2023? Just just resign from the Supreme Court, you know, resign from the federal judiciary and have a vacancy. Um, because that way I know that the current president who I like can appoint my successor, right? Then again, they're timing their departures just as, as, as we don't want them to do. What keeps them from, from doing that? Well, if, you know, one of the things is they would have to resign as a federal judge, right? So they would um, no longer be able to sit on lower courts. They, um, you know, that could be part of a law. You could, uh, you, you, you know, they, they may have to um, thwart their pension, right? That might be another penalty, right? If they were to, to do something like that. Um, you know, so there are ways, I think, but, but the question is a good one, is to think through unintended consequences, right? What keeps them from playing politics, even with 18 year staggered terms? Um, maybe there's nothing that keeps them from doing that, right? Um, maybe a president who we hope would appoint older jurists, right? Older people to the Supreme Court with more experience, maybe the president wouldn't. Maybe the president would still appoint the youngest people possible so that those people would still, you know, if you appoint someone who's 40 and they're forced to retire at 58, they still have this whole career ahead of them. Then they're gonna be wanting, right? Ambitious to do other things and they're gonna need, right? Uh, 
you know, their Republican presidents or Republican friends or whoever, Democratic presidents, Democratic friends, to support them in their future endeavors. And so, you know, they, that might actually become more grounds for partisanship. So these are tough questions and, and, and there's no easy answer, but we should be thinking about reform. Um, I, you know, now is a unique chance that we might get some reform and, and not only thinking about potential reforms, but potential consequences too. Thank you. So we've had several people ask different versions of questions related to this notion of good behavior in, in Article 3. And essentially, the, the questions boil down to this. I'm paraphrasing from about half a dozen. What is to prevent the current Supreme Court from simply declaring a statute unconstitutional since the justices themselves have basically agreed that good behavior equals life tenure. Yeah, I love that question. I, you know, the, 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 we, it's, uh, students often ask that question in, in different forms, but this idea that, you know, don't all the justices have to recuse themselves if they're ruling on a case that involves themselves, right? I mean, don't they have a conflict of interest? And, 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 and you know, the, it's it's a it's a fascinating question. They they wouldn't uh, obviously in that in that in that case, but it it sort of gets at this this larger question about recusal, which is another potential reform that we might want to think about. Right right now, justices choose when to sit and when not to sit on a case. Right they they choose whether to recuse themselves or not, and you know you know interest groups and others you know, lobby and provide legal briefs and argue, hey, justice so-and-so should not sit on this case, but the justice decides for themselves. Maybe that shouldn't be the case, right? Maybe justice shouldn't be deciding for themselves uh, which cases to sit on and which cases not to sit on. But, you know, this, this, this is a very interesting point. If you pass a statute or even a constitutional amendment, um, the justices are going to, are the justices going to strike down a constitutional amendment because it conflicts with another Part of the Constitution, this this kind of question, right, uh, arises too. And I, you know, there are no, there are no easy answers here. Um, but I do think one of the things to think about is that, you know, if the American people want something bad enough, right, if there's broad, large majorities for something, the American people tend to get that over time. They may not get it in the short term, but they would get it in the long run. And so, um, whatever reform we're thinking about, there's going to need to be some major groundswell. The more um, the more serious the reform, the more major the groundswell has to be behind it in order for it to have any chance of passing, which makes me think very little reform is going to happen this time. Yeah, I would agree with you there. Um, all right, so so we're coming up on, on the eight o'clock hour. So we're going to do maybe a couple more questions uh, and then we'll we'll let people go for the night. So the next question comes from Andre and he says, uh, I know that I noticed that you have greatly emphasized issues of uh, political polarization. Do you think the chief core issue is because of life tenure, or do you think that the chief issue is the fact that the Supreme Court plays too large a role in our society? Yeah, I mean, I think all of those things are intertwined um, in a lot of ways. The court has become more activist over time and the research shows that they are willing to get involved in the most hot button controversial issues of the, of the day in a way that they hadn't historically been doing and so we have the most activist supreme court in history in that sense willing to get involved willing to strike down popularly enacted laws whether those are federal or on the state level whether those are liberal or conservative this is a court that wants to be in the fray and wants to get involved um and so they have brought this on themselves to some extent, right? By becoming activists in that sense from the left and the right, right? They want to um, be a part of the policy making process. Um, you know, in, in that sense, you know, they are involved and now it's a question of how far they're, they're going to go, right? I think that the, the New Deal example was a good one. Uh, and I don't think that that's lost on the current court. Chief Justice Roberts talked about that during his confirmation hearings, right? Talks about these, black marks in the court's history, including, um, you know, attempts to pack the court. And we don't want to go down those paths again, he said. And his behavior since he left the court has been entirely consistent with that. He's trying desperately to protect the institution against those that would try to push it to the extremes on the left and the right, I think. Um, 
And so in that sense, you know, Roberts, you know, hit, there was an interesting case last term, some of you may have seen, it was an eight to one decision where he was the only justice in dissent because he tried to rule so narrowly that he could get no one on either side to agree with him. Um, and, but they all agreed, right? On a, so it was very interesting, a sort of solo dissent, um, the only time he's ever done that and, and, and I'm not, unable to convince anyone to uh, vote, vote with him. Will we see more of that? Will we see Roberts in dissent more? Will we see the rise of the conservative wing without him? Um, as in the Texas case, right, where they allowed the law to, to go into effect. If we see more of that, then we're going to see more calls for reform, more serious reform, and it becomes more likely. If we don't see that, if the court continues to be moderate and follow the chief for the most part um, and picks its battles very carefully, then we won't, and it probably will, then we won't see any reform. I was wondering if the Dean Hubbard wanted to weigh in. I've sort of monopolized. I didn't know if he wanted to weigh in on some of these questions. He's got a great deal of experience with a lot of these issues. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll give him a chance. Is he coming on? Oh, well, there he is. I, I can't add or I can't improve on what's already been said by Professor Ward. He's doing a great job. <laughs> so so let's ask uh, two more questions and then we can can wrap things up. Um, so Jordan asks. Is there evidence that judiciaries that are directly elected in state courts, do those elections make them any more or less partisan? Right. So, yes. Do, do judicial elections make justices more responsive to the public, right, and less independent, you might, you might say? That's certainly what voters wanted, right? When they <laughs> abolished live tenure and, and wanted more control over the judiciary, um, are judges more responsive? Uh, Kirk, you, you may know that research better than I do. I think the answer is yes, they are. Um, I think the research shows that, but I think it depends on certain factors. And, and part of the trouble is that states are different in terms of their systems, um, in terms of whether there's retention elections or you know are they partisan or nonpartisan elections. So it's hard to make a lot of comparisons because each state does things slightly differently. Um, but we, but it's good that you are asking questions about the state level and looking to states because as the justices themselves have said, the states are laboratories of democracy, right? And, and so here we have uh, laboratory experiments regarding um, judges who are elected, judges who have mandatory uh, retirement, judges who serve for terms, and we can look at the states to see what the effect of those are. And, and hopefully as we have these discussions in the coming months, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a populace, we'll be looking at those things and see more articles on those things. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great answer. And, and you're right, the, the state court research is kind of mixed on, on whether elections actually make judges more or less partisan. Um, really, it's, it's pretty inconclusive at, at the moment. Uh, so let's do one more question. Um, and this one comes from Stephen, and, and he asks, with the workings of the branches of government becoming more and more partisan, do you think bringing about term limits actually makes the court nonpartisan, or does that further uh, complicate and potentially exacerbate the issue? Yeah, that's it. That's the best question, right? The ultimate question that we are all going to be left thinking about. Um, you know, term limits may solve some of the problems that we're talking about right, with regard to justices being political, right, in their departure decisions, trying to time their retirements, and some of them succeeding with the case of Kennedy, some of them failing in the case of Ginsburg. Um, you know, term limits would take that decision out of their hands. It would solve that problem. But as we've mentioned, it may open up a can of worms and cause other problems that are unforeseen. Um, and so, you know, we always want to be careful, right? Um, and, and when we when we enact public policy, make sure we know the implications. And and I'll be curious to see what the president's commission comes up with because they're supposed to issue a giant report. They are the ones who are supposed to be, and some of our colleagues are on that commission, debating these issues, going through them in full, and issuing a report that we can all read and then be you know be able to think about these issues and get all of the pros and cons and and weigh in on that. And and so I hope that that process works. But, but again, at the end of the day, if the justices um, follow the chief and stay in the middle and try to keep their institution out of the political sphere as much as possible and out of extreme rulings, um, no one will even remember this effort at judicial reform right now. Yeah, thank you very much. 
so before I, I kind of close things out, let me invite Dean Hubbard, uh, if, if you would like to come in and just give a couple of, of closing remarks. Well, I just want to thank uh, Professor Ward. I think he did a superb job of, of teeing up these issues and providing a lot of uh, information that was a good refresher on many points and some great new information on other points. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I think the ultimate goal is to make sure that to the extent possible in this partisan environment that the court is able to maintain some semblance of judicial independence. And again, this, this goes back to Magna Carta. Uh, the roots of it are, are that ingrained in our society. And, and I think it's the responsibility of all of us, regardless of what the debate is, that we, we, we ourselves fight for the maintenance and preservation and protection of that judicial independence. If it gets to the point where the public expects a court to rule because the president says it ought to rule that way or a governor says it ought to rule that way, um, we've really lost something in terms of the strength and, and of our democratic, our constitutional democracy. So it's really up to all of us as citizens to, to really fight for that, the preservation of, of judicial independence. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's incredibly well said. Uh, so, so let me close things out. Um, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Department of Political Science, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Law, the entire University of South Carolina community. Uh, to, to Dr. Art Ward, thank you so much for spending some, some time with us, uh, helping us get a little bit smarter about life tenure and, and those implications and what potential reforms might bring. So for all of you that, that joined, our thanks to you for, for being here with us for the last hour or so. Uh, happy Constitution Day. Uh, which is tomorrow. Um, and certainly as, as we move forward, pay attention to the, the presidential commission that Dr. Ward referenced, that report should be coming shortly, uh, and pay attention to the debates about some of these reforms and, and whether or not that would be a step in the right direction, however that might be defined. So thank you again. Appreciate you being here. Dr. Ward, fantastic job. Thank you to everybody. Have a good night.